Okay, w welcome everyone. Um, but as he makes his way up just now, well, th this is Palmira and Diego Lopez. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Palmira's heard enough of Diego and is leaving already. Thank you, Palmira. It's great to have you with us. And is little Diego here? He's in the crash. Okay, you go sort him. Yeah, do, do what you do. Bless you. Well, um, it's great to have Diego and Palmeira with us. We're going to hear a little bit from uh, Diego today. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you to be here. Thank you for having us. I think he's a little nervous. He's not seeing so many people together. So that, You'll is, be fine. that is Leo Diego. It's, it's yeah. never a problem for you to talk. Oh, so, thank uh, you. Uh, well, um, I, I'd like to take some time just to interview Diego, get a little know a little more about him uh, so you can, so you can pray for him and Palmira and the ministry that they're in. And then also we want to hear a little bit about what you're doing as well. But let's go, um, let's go back, some, some personal questions. Uh, well, not too personal, but let's go back to when you were younger. So you were brought up in Colombia, you were there as a child, and then a little bit also when you're a teenager as well. Um, what was life like growing up for you in Colombia? Uh, as a child and then as a teenager also? So growing up, we, we were back and forwards between Colombia and Spain. And my mom had me as a teenager. And um, it was, it was my, my family, my, great, my grandparents who raised me up. And it was kind of a difficult situation. Was in the, in the, I grew up in the late 80s and 90s. And it was very convulsive in Colombia. There was a lot of uh, a war between the drug dealers and the government. So we would hear the bombings and things happening all over the place. There was no sense of security or anything like that. So there was a lot of immigration. So people moved to the United States and to Spain mostly. And that was part of what my mom did. She, she left Colombia and moved to Spain when, when I was still very young. And, and so for, for you, um, how, did, how did the journey to Jesus begin? What, you know, what, what, what was that like for you? Who introduced you to so, this Jesus? Um, when I was in Spain, I wasn't adapting well to the culture, so I went back to Colombia. And when I was there, I think God worked in my prevailing grace by bringing me into sports. So I did Taekwondo for a number of years. I did quite well. I was kind of uh, in the local team, national team. And then I, went, I wasn't doing too well at one point. And I have some friends who invited me to church. It was an evangelical church. And I loved it because my family, somebody who grew up with our family, uh, go into a church and meet people and people who care about you, that become our family. And then from there, we, um, I really felt a call to share the good news of Jesus with people, sharing what God has done in our lives, he's done in my life with other people. And I moved to, to Spain to try to do that and reconnect with my friends there. And that's when I went to an Asylum church in Barcelona. We have a nice church there, just in the outskirts of Barcelona, just close and we will become part of that church. And then we enter this other family, which is the Nazarene Church. So, uh, so you're Colombia, Spain, Barcelona, and then Manchester uh, became an important place for you. There's a picture of you, just in case you forget. Um, you ended up in Manchester. How did you end up in Manchester? And in what ways was that significant for you there? Well, I... I wanted to go to Bible school. We had a Bible school in Germany, Switzerland, border. And, but you needed to learn English, and I didn't know English very well, or at all. So I was trying to um, enter. I did the test three times, but um, I couldn't enter. But somebody from the UK went to a youth camp in Spain, and they told us about this wonderful place that is Manchester. And I moved back there um, just to learn English. The next day, I got a job at the Midland Hotel. I didn't know I had a job there, so this person had a friend, and they interviewed me, and they brought me the uniform, and they said, you're starting tonight, and I didn't even know what I was doing, but uh, it was wonderful. It was, it was a great experience. People at the hotel was good. I then began to learn English, which was good, but I went to Longside Church. That was my other family. I walk in there one Sunday. I didn't understand what was going on, and I just recognized some of the songs, and people were really nice, and um, it was good. About four years later, I became part of the pastoral team in that church. Having learned some English as well. A, a little bit. 
Yeah, I did. I did, and then I went to college in Germany. And, but I'd really felt drawn back to Manchester. And I, I cut my time short there to two years. Because with the time when I was in Manchester for those nine months, I was really um, got to see ministry in a different way. It was very community-oriented. It was a church then. It was outward-looking. It was a church that didn't accept anybody. It was a church that has a lot of equality between people. And I, was, I wanted to be part of that church for the rest of my life. And I went back and transferred to NTC and then did a placement. And then I was in the pastoral team. For those of you who are new to Nazarene terms, NTC is Nazarene Theological College, which is down in Manchester. And your, your time there and your time in Longsight, uh, which is one of our Nazarene churches in, in, uh, in, in Manchester. I mean, these were, these were really influential years for you. Can, can you articulate how they were influential? How did they shape you? So I came from an environment in which church was done differently. Um, it was very inward looking. It was about getting people in. Um, but it was influential in the way that we ministered to the community. We don't have a huge agenda of converting people, but we're loving people and help with refugees and help with people of all backgrounds. And I was really um, taken for that. And that I met some great people like Deidre and the Browers and many friends there that we call our family. And it was, it was really a time that shaped me in many ways. And one of the things, you know, as, as, as you talk, Diego, is that you've mentioned it in every place you've went to and you went to a church, there was something about it as family, mm. as family and the way in which we welcome people who start off as strangers, mm. but that we're family to the stranger. Is, is that, am I picking up rightly? That Absolutely. That and it's one of the few places that you can be family with people you will not normally meet with mm. or don't have the opportunity. So me being foreign in this land, going to Manchester, getting to know the culture from the inside, getting to know people, getting invited to the houses. And something very funny happened. So in my culture, if somebody invites you to, to the house for lunch or for something, you always should say no. Because if you say yes very quickly, uh, it means you're too eager. And, but also, if they don't insist, it's because they never really mean it. So when people ask me for lunch, I would always say no, and they just walk away. <laughs> but very quickly, I learned that I had to say yes <laughs> first time around <laughs> if I wanted to get some food that day. <laughs> so it was beautiful to, to be part of that community. Now, uh, you, do you now have your own family? How did you and Palmyra meet? Well, um, as the church started to grow, there was a group of young adults that started coming from nearby, and she was part of that group of young adults and that started coming to church. And then that's how we got together with the Church of the Nazarene. And we got married in 2010. And in 2022, we have Diego. It was a bit of a struggle to have kids. And there was a point in which we were kind of content. We were fine. We thought we were never going to have kids. And we had a few miscarriages and challenges. And, and we gave up um, because we were fulfilled and complete. And, and we always say the church is our family. And, but one day the Lord surprises us and here is, um, cool, you know, yeah, we wouldn't change a lot for anything. So, um, Can I just lean into that s season? Mm -hmm. um, s sometimes it's in the, the most challenging times uh, and seasons that w God shows us or teaches us things. Um, in, that, in that season before G Diego Jr. arrived, did you sense that God was showing you or teaching you things? It is. Oh, here he comes. Well, well certainly. We, it was very traumatic, but we have peace. And we have peace because we knew God had a bigger plan for our lives. He had, a, <laughs> he had a plan for something else. And even when we are going through more difficult times, people do come and pray with us. And our families and friends couldn't believe um, our, our heart. Our heart was set in Jesus and not in the things of this world, the things that could we do, could be doing by ourselves. So it was very instrumental to have good people around us mm. um, who, and good examples and role models. Mm. And I think that's one of the, now when I look at my ministry and we look at what we do, I just go back to see what other people around us did to us. Mm. Thank you. 
Well, let's, uh, let's shift a little to your, uh, your work in leadership and what you're doing as a, a, a missionary in uh, your field. So you're appointed in global missions a while back um, as Eurasia Regional Youth Coordinator. Um, from my perspective, that always looked like a lot of fun wherever you were, <laughs> wherever young people were gathered. There was always a bit of chaos, lots of laughter. Um, I know you're not doing that role anymore, but what, what did you do? What, what was your job there? What was your goal? How did you impact the young people? How were you impacted by them? No, so that came a little bit unexpectedly. And I, I don't know if you guys ever heard of a guy called Bruce Lloyd. He was a pastor in Sheffield. And he pastored this church for 37 years. And he was always my hero. I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be in my community and in Longside for the rest of my life and beyond. So I never considered moving away or can never consider doing anything else than I was working in my local community. And it was a really good combination because I was working on my local church uh, part-time and I was working for a local school which was re right behind our church part-time. And I was working for a youth project that did a lot of detached work, street work on that community. So I was really, really well embedded there, and I wanted to do that for the rest of my life. And when this opportunity came to serve the church, um, the Nazarene Church youth in Europe and Asia, um, it was a bit of a toil in my mind to do it or not doing it. Um, but the Lord gave us peace, and then I kept the church part-time and dropped everything else. And we did this, and it's very overwhelming because you're working with people from all the way from the Azores, which is some islands in the, in the ocean between here and Canada, and all the way to Bangladesh, all the countries in between. So it's very hard to even have one message. It's even hard to have one strategy. It's even hard to use one language. We operate in something like 28 different languages. And so what we did is we decided to focus on training. And we, in partnership with the, with the NASA in college, we created this training called Nexus. And we help young leaders from all from here to there to work in their own language, in their own context, and figure out, figuring out what does youth ministry look like. It's probably beyond having a youth service. It's something deeper and, and accompanying of people more than that. And so that's what we did. And uh, that's what I did for almost eight years. And it was a lot of fun, as you said. I met people like Ian in that journey, not because he was young. He was young, but because he was also a part of the missionary structure at the time, and he actually interviewed us um, to be missionaries in the Netherlands, and we have good memories of Ian. Visit, I visited Ian as well in, in Glasgow, and we walked around the streets a couple of times, and that was fun to see you in action. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any, 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 any stories from that from season? You. No, 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 not about me. Okay. Goodness, not about me. Can, can uh, share any a few. stories from those years of, you know, just the significant things that you saw amongst young people or that you know? You know, my first trip as an NYI um, regional coordinator was to Belfast, um, the exotic land of Belfast. And I met um, my first NYI event in that role, and it was the NYUK election. And I met Amy, who is now the coordinator for that. And it was, it was good to see her journey. It's good to see her grow into now she being the coordinator for the whole region. And so that was, that was beautiful to see, be able to accompany her. But I work with young people in Manchester. And it was very difficult because you work with very unmotivated uh, group of secular young people in that area. But now going to places and see young people who love the Lord. Because I was now working with Christians. And people who love the Lord like Jack that was uh, part of this church or, or James or uh, Sammy. And see how they love the Lord and just nudge a little bit in one direction and see how things could happen and create an opportunities and gather young people in places and seeing the world in a different way or doing this cross-cultural stuff. You know, getting people from, you know, Jordan visiting other countries. And uh, one of my great joys is to meet this young woman in India who was so great, so articulated, didn't have a lot of opportunities. And give you the opportunity to see the world and see other things. And last year, she got a master's degree from 
um, NTC in Manchester. So it's beautiful to see the journey of people in that sense, getting to know them young and then accompanying across a few years. That's great. Now, you're, you've moved role uh, 2022. You were appointed a field strategy coordinator in the Western Mediterranean. Um, first of all, what, what countries would that cover? So we covered the world for Spain, France, Portugal, and Italy. All the holiday destinations. Did you know? <laughs> um, You're welcome. <laughs> what, what do you do? Well, um, before that, I need to let you know how we ended up leaving Spain. So we, we went on the 13th of March, 2020, because it was Palmyra's one year anniversary of his passing on that month. So we went to be with her mother, and then COVID happened, and we got stuck there, and we never came back. Um, but as I was there, I was getting involved with the church, and they asked me to be a district superintendent of Spain as the person who was there was retiring. And that grew into um, Jim, a friend of yours. Um, he sent his greetings. He told me, Diego, send my greetings to everybody there in Perth. And tell them that Ian, and say hi to Ian, and say to Ian that he's the second best good-looking preacher they ever had. And he's fourth. <laughs> I was thinking it was because I'm preaching later on, so maybe he was thinking of me being the first. <laughs> so, but yeah, he, he trusted me and appointed me to that role against all odds. And what we do is we, we oversee the work for those four countries. And in Spain, I do a little bit more because I'm district superintendent. And we just work on the strategy. Spain, France, Portugal, and Italy, they're very much a mission field. Um, they have very post-Christian um, areas, but also Catholic in, in their belief, and more like kind of non-practicing Catholic. And as the case in France and Spain as well, like they have very traumatic experiences with the Catholic Church. So it's very difficult to connect. So it's, it's very much the mission field. We have 37 churches across all those four countries and in some countries we've been there quite a long time and the church has not been able to explode or grow very much for some reason. So any specific ministries or projects or um, you know places where you you know you're seeing something happen or you or you just want to let us know about and so we can be praying? This sounds a little bit biased but Spain is going is doing well only by the grace of God. If we have six churches and they're really spread apart. So one is in Seville, which is in the south. A couple of Madrid, uh, which is kind of 600 kilometers. And east, we have another two, which is another 400 kilometers. And then we have another one in Barcelona, another 400 kilometers. So they're really spread out. Um, but um, over this past year, um, by the grace of God only, all those churches have grown, not just numerically, but also... And with the buildings, we have been able to, and working with Steve and Jim, we have been able to buy new buildings for three, two of them and half for the other one, or rented the building next door so that we can expand the ministry. And that is happening for all six churches. And that has been a really, a really real blessing of what the Lord is doing there. And, and I also want to thank you because you guys have been part of that journey. You know, every time you give to World Evangelism Fund, um, I don't know what you call that offering here. In some places, they call it differently. Or when you give to Alabaster, those funds help us. And they're certainly helping us there in Spain. And in Portugal as well, we just, um, we have this church that it was in crisis. Three years ago, there was only like 10 people left. And we have this young Brazilian pastor move in. And last year, we expanded. And we didn't have a lot of money to build. So we, we, we bought a tent. And they just did a great job with that tent. And now we can fit 150 people in that tent in the car park and we used the church building which was only very small for the Sunday school classes and so yeah the Lord is moving in a great way there and yeah go on yeah I, I, in, I, in a few moments we, we will sing again and we'll, we'll take up a second offering those of you who are on our mailing list will know that we, we said you know come prepared to give again on Sundays because it, for the missionaries whether it it's the Diego and Palera in uh, West Med or, or wherever our missionaries are in the world. They, they're there because churches like ours uh, and Nazarene churches all across the world are praying, sending money so that we can continue to support 
the uh, missionary work, the spreading of the gospel in, in all kinds of different places. So we're going to do that in a few moments. What, what, are you, what are you most excited about and what are your hopes for the next few years for your field in West Med? So it does seem that, um, you know, when we say Paris and Madrid and Lisbon and Porto, they're really great places and holy desti destinations, as um, Ian said. Um, but there are places that absolutely need Jesus. There are places that um, the Protestant church is struggling uh, to, to enter. Um, we know there for the sake of being there. We know there for the sake of put a flag in. But we are there to help people worship in a different way. We are there to help people experience God in a different way. And I don't know how you felt today, but I really felt the Holy Spirit in this place. And we really replicate, we want to replicate that and give those experiences to people. And it gets me excited that we're there, that our church is willing to invest in those places, that we have a presence. And then people are getting to know Jesus through the ministry of the church, them the Nazarene there, and, and beyond. So that, that excites me. Um, excites me uh, the fact that I, ministerially, I, I live here 17 years in the UK. So I grew up here, I will say. We call this place home. We, bef we, we become British a few years ago. Um, and we really feel, and where we are in Spain, we do try to connect with a lot of with the British community. I helped in a British church. We have a little British church, very thriving in, in the south of Spain. And the, everybody's over the age of 70, but you wouldn't believe how thriving they are. We just changed the leadership from somebody who is 84 to somebody who is 77. And we do see some tension because this 77-year-old guy is so much, on, so much energy. And... And he wants to do every, he's aware that he hasn't got a lot of time. So he wants to do everything in this couple of years. So it's beautiful to see that. But um, yeah, just pray for what we do in there and for that place. But what I said is that the Lord has taught me a lot here in Britain. And for as much as we see our church in Britain, we, we have this idea that it's struggling and that it's not, it's not what it used to be. I think it's doing great. I think um, there's a lot of things that I learned here of being outward looking. Uh, we're trying to do Alpha, took a photo to send to our leaders because they're trying to introduce them to Alpha and um, to do evangelism in a different way. When I ask them, what do you do for evangelism? And they want to go and stand in a street corner. But I say, hey, there is this tool, Alpha, that is going fantastic. And sorry, Ian is not paying me to do this, but we had uh, in this church in Madrid, they never done any other evangelism than starting on a street corner. And I asked them, so how many people do you ever go in the church? And say, no one. But they gather every other week very faithfully to do that. Last year we did Alpha. And they had 52 new people coming through the church. Not saying that all 52 stayed. But 52 people they never met before. And out of those 52 people, six people give their life to the Lord. That is much more <laughs> results than we've seen in all these years with the evangelism in a different way. We need to change our, the way we think. We did not plant the synchronizing, but, <laughs> but I'm glad I look forward to all the sign-ups later on for who's going to run Alpha in their homes or whatever it is. Um, Diego, we want, to, we want to pray for you, for Palmira, for little Diego. We want to pray for the work you're doing. Um, how, what, what can we be praying for you uh, as a leader as well as you personally? So we don't have the depth uh, that we might have in, in, in here in Britain, that we don't have a lot of ordained elders. Um, in Spain only, we have three ordained elders. And so it requires a lot of um, me, because moving around, uh, setting up boards, um, helping the church work with, with the laity. So I do move a lot. Um, there is a lot of excitement. There is a lot of opportunities. So uh, between October and December, I'm going to be traveling a lot um, with teams and with people and that want to come and see the work, and want to invest in the work, they want to be part of the work that is happening in West Med. So pray for my stamina, for my health, pray for my family, that we stay together, and that we, um, as we do this work together, so Palmira finished her job a couple of years, last year, so now we're doing this together, and we're trying to um, support each other in this journey. So pray for us, and pray for our pastors, especially in Portugal, we have a lot of... Um, elderly pastors, and the Bible college is not doing great in getting people in. In Spain, it's doing great. We have six churches and 35 students, 
So that's what we know. And so we made some changes in Portugal uh, to help um, the, the church there to get new leadership in. We have um, 17 churches and about seven or eight are pastors, right? Pastors who are over 75. So we do need praying for some of our young people to step in and for us to create a good pathway for them. Um, so that will be a great prayer request. That's good. Thank you. Worship team, would you come up and, and join us? Steve, uh, was Ruth here? Did, did, did Palmyra stay in? Yes. Uh, yes. Steve has also just shifted uh, post uh, from a regional to a global responsibility for missions and ask him to come up with Ruth and just lay hands on this wonderful uh, family and pray for them, uh, if you would. And then we're going to uplift a, an offering for them and for the work that they're doing. Give generously. We want to bless them as we pray and as we give. Lord, we thank you for all we've heard this morning, how you are moving even within our own continent. We thank you for the blessing of the Lopez family with us today. Lord, continue to empower them with your Holy Spirit. Continue to fill them with your power and your strength and even stamina for their travels as they continue to travel and minister in Spain, in Portugal, in France, and in Italy. Lord, may you continue to guide and direct them. May they be led by your Spirit. We pray that God will continue to open up these new doors of ministry for them. Bless the partnerships they already have in each country and community. And Lord, I just think about the different languages that they're ministering in as well. Will you help them to communicate effectively in other cultures and languages from their own? Lord, may your word continue to spread easily and deeply throughout their field. But when ministries are seeming hard or fruitless and there are challenges, we pray that seeds are still being sown as people hear and see the love of Christ in his people. As they manage their field resources, will you give them wisdom as they work with their team and volunteers and also the finances that you entrust them with? Guide them, direct them. Bless their marriage. Bless we Diego. Guide and direct them as a family. May they follow your will as they work with church and pastors throughout this area. Keep them safe and secure in you. We thank you for the missionary retreat that they've just been on this past week and for the time of rest and relaxation that they have had. Would you remind them to look for pockets of restoration that they can have with you in, amid, in the midst of serving you and others? Bless them, Lord, abundantly. And may we be faithful here in Trinity to remember to support them through our prayers and through our giving in the future. In your holy name we ask. Amen. So I wanted to apologize about my accent, but we all know that in Britain we all have different accents. So I'm going to do my best Manchester accent today, so bear with me. And I want to take you to scripture, to Mark 6. We're going to read 1 till 6. Jesus left. There and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed with where he did this man get these things. They asked, What this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't he the carpenter? Isn't he? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town. Among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at the lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Uh, 
when I was preparing for this message, um, I came across something very interesting I never knew before. Maybe you knew, Ian, because you're a doctor in theology. But it's this idea that Jesus was a carpenter. All my life, I thought Jesus was a carpenter. But the word they use here is this word called tecton. And they say, well, it could be used for a carpenter, but also can be used to be a mason, stone mason. And the likelihood is that he worked with both, but mostly he worked with stone. Because when they did some research, they realized that in the area, there's a lot of quarries, and a stone was used more than wood. And I thought that was very interesting. But the most interesting part of it is not that, that whether he was a carpenter or was uh, working with stone. The most interesting of that is that he was a laborer. He was a person that worked with his hands. That um, he wasn't a, a theologian. He wasn't a doctor in the synagogues. He wasn't, um, he was not likely the person that everybody expected him to be. He was the son of Joseph, the carpenter, the laborer. He was a brother of Joseph, and his sisters were there. He was one of them, and they couldn't believe that he was performing and doing all these things. He was a person that was like anybody else. And that is what is amazing about faith, that our Messiah came in a form of a man. Then he came in a form of a normal person. He, was, he didn't come as people would expect him to be. They thought he was going to come as a, as a king or as a warrior or, this, or have this, all this power that would liberate his people from the shekels. He did do that in the end, but it wasn't what everybody expected. And for me, the sad thing about this story is what he says that Jesus could not perform miracles there. He couldn't perform many miracles. He just could lay hands in a few people. Jesus could not believe the disbelief of his people. And then this famous phrase comes. A prophet is not with honor in his own land. And we all know that phrase is even used in the, in the secular world. But because of the prejudice of his own people, because of the prejudice of the neighbors and the friends and the people that saw him grow up, they could not be blessed by his miracles. He could not be blessed by his presence and he could not be blessed by him because the lack of belief. Then this man, who was the unlikely man, who didn't have the qualifications, who didn't have, uh, he was a, a laborer who could do all these things. He, that was not what they expected. And I was wondering, how many times are we like that? How many times we feel that about ourselves? I'm not qualified. I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too retired. I cannot do this. How many times we lost the blessing because we don't expect better things in people. Because we don't expect that people can do things. We don't expect that God can use others because of this or this or that. If we see a scripture and we see a history, we see everything that it happens. And it's always the unexpected. Joseph. He was in prison and God used him to be next to Pharaoh, to the Pharaoh. Moses, he was the unexpected person and God is still using to liberate his land, his people from this land. Paul killed a man, killed many, and God is still using him to be an apostle. And even his apostles, they were unlikely. They were not what people expect them to be. And they came from all different backgrounds. And Jesus himself, he was not what people expect him to be. Less, even less his own people. The people that saw him grow. We don't have a lot of a history of um, how Jesus was like growing up. But people knew him. People knew him growing up. And that couldn't believe that that boy now is doing these things. I don't know if you feel like that sometimes. I don't know if you feel like, oh, I don't know whether I can do this or not. I don't know if I am able to run an alpha course in my house. Let's keep on that thing. Or in my workplace. Or in the coffee shop or in that place. I don't know if I'm able to share with others what God has done in my life. I don't know. I'm not sure whether I go into missions because I'm not this person or that other person. 
I don't know if I am not able to be what God wants me to be. For whatever reason. Because people out there have told us, you cannot do it. Because we, can't, we are not able to show what God has done in our lives. I, I was told that was needs to be short, so I'll make it short. But I want to give you with these words of encouragement. It doesn't matter whether you feel that you can serve the Lord in a particular way or not. Whether you are to make a decision, a life, a life decision. Because people told you you cannot do it. Or that you think that of somebody else. That you're prejudiced towards that person because they haven't got the qualification or they haven't got the looks or they can haven't got the height or they haven't got whatever they need to have. The Lord still can be using us. And if we can take something from this story, is that God used the most unlikely to liberate the world. Let me pray for you. I'm going to do it in Spanish. Señor y Padre Celestial, gracias por mis hermanos, mis hermanas en este lugar. Gracias por sus vidas, por su sacrificio. Porque hoy podrían estar en cualquier otro lugar, pero están aquí buscándote. Gracias por eh, la oportunidad que tenemos de compartir, de estar los unos con los otros. Y en los momentos en que sentimos prejuicios para otros, en momentos en que sentimos que otras personas no son suficientemente calificadas o cualificadas, danos la gracia de Dios. Y danos la gracia de Dios para nosotros mismos también. En el nombre de Jesús, te damos gracias. Amén.